welcome everybody to today's seminar uh, of Friday's CEO seminars. And today we have uh, a guest who, who comes from the land of Gao, well, the, not just the land, the alma mater of Gauss, the alma mater of Maria Goepenmeyer, Abbe, and also recently Stefan Hell. There is plenty of amazing scientists in that university. I, all, I very highly recommend to the students to check the list of the, the people that can be related to the University of Göttingen in Germany. So our speaker today is absolutely no less than any one of the, the person I mentioned, and uh, is, is Professor Tim Saldit. Uh, please let me read a little bit of his curriculum. So Professor Saldit studied at the Ludwig Maximilian University in München, uh, studied physics, physics there and also got his PhD in the same university. Um, um, he worked for a while as a research assistant in the same university and uh, while he also did a postdoctoral stay at the University of California at Santa Barbara with Professor Sofinia. Um, he went on later to be professor of physics and he finally got his, his actual position at the University of Göttingen in 2002. He's also, uh, served, he also served as department chair for a while at the Faculty of Physics at the same university in, in Göttingen. Uh, just a few of the many awards and uh, honors he received during his career, uh, starting from the Ernest Eckhart Koch Prize, I feel like my, my German accent is completely lost. <laughs> um, he worked also as a spokesperson for many initiatives in Germany of nanospectroscopy and, and X-ray imaging. Uh, he was advisor and a review board member for the European X-ray free electron laser in Hamburg and also elected member of the German Committee for Synchrotron Radiation. He's, he's still a member of the uh, Scientific Council of DESI. Um, and uh, well, okay, for, for uh, about his um, scientific interest, we can list uh, structural biophysics, which is a little bit the reason why I, I know him, X-ray optics uh, and imaging, membrane self-assembly and shape transformation, phase contrast tomography and biochemical imaging, biomedical imaging, sorry, and synchrotron radiation in general. So uh, he has made an enormous contribution to uh, broaden the limits, the applicability of X-ray optics and the use of X-ray radiation to the study of materials, in particular biological materials. I don't want to add anything more to this presentation and I'm going to leave him uh, the, the word for his talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Valeria, for the kind introduction and the, uh, intro the invitation. It's, it's great to be uh, in Mexico now, and here in Germany it's uh, um, 6 uh, p.m. Friday uh, um, afternoon, and this is, of course, a highlight of the week now to be at your institute, at least virtually. So I'm going to present you uh, the efforts uh, of, uh, that we have uh, undergone over the recent years to study tissues, uh, in particular human tissues, uh, by new uh, ways of uh, carrying out face contrast X-ray tomography at high resolution. We also call this holographic uh, tomography. And I'm going to share a few recent results on neuronal tissues, uh, human brain imaging at high resolution. Uh, in, in three dimensions, uh, human lung tissue uh, related to a very uh, recent uh, research that, that we took up uh, during the pandemic. And also, uh, well, this is not human, this is a small animal heart for those of you who can recognize here the, the, the shape of a mouse heart. Um, much of this work is funded by our local uh, cluster of excellence where uh, the goal is, is really to develop new photonic approaches uh, uh, in all spectral ranges, um, optical development, but also translation to, uh, for instance, medical um, uh, applications. And here now, I must see that my um, presentation doesn't move. 
I'm very uh, oh that that's uh, that, that's very bad let me try uh, to share it again maybe yeah. it has frozen uh, that shouldn't uh, shouldn't happen of course and uh, now I I not let me um yeah now I can I can I can take you to the Göttingen campus sorry for this this is our institute it's uh, where Valeria Piazza also did uh, a postdoctoral research a few years uh, back we have plenty of different institutions the university Max Planck but they all work together on this campus and microscopy and bioimaging is an important part of our let's say portfolio and this is of course best known for Stefan Hell and his development of super resolution stat and min flux flux uh, mic microscopy but we really have it across uh, many different spectral ranges and we also include a lot of imaging computational imaging and inverse mathematics um, for this purpose and again I have uh, this problem I'm sorry I'm not I'm using Zoom uh, uh, normally, and um, here I have a problem with my. Um, I see too, uh, okay. You, I, I think I, I shouldn't uh, stay too long on the slide. This is an aerial. <laughs> this is an aerial view, and you can see our institute and our neighboring uh, our neighbors. Um, and there are many different modalities and here's the Institute for X-ray physics and this is where we work and um, it's 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 again uh, uh, there's 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 a problem let me try whether uh, if I don't take if I take yeah here I can I can I can this I can move forward with these uh, oh sorry for this so um, uh, much of what I show you today has been collected uh, the data and the results have been obtained uh, by synchrotron radiation and uh, over the last uh, years we've had the chance to build an instrument um, for for nano imaging based on a very particular optics waveguide x-ray optics which we have developed and uh, we operate together with DAISY it's open for users if you have a good uh, application a beam time proposal you can also work at this instrument so we also help users to get initiated and get their research done but of course all our projects also um, uh, um, are carried out over there not all of them we now also have some uh, face contrast uh, micro focus uh, sources uh, that that perform fairly well maybe at the end I can show you a few examples so that was north to uh, uh, let's say three hours away to Hamburg where DAISY uh, synchrotron sources are located the medical um, institute is uh, just uh, 800 meters uh, south and a lot of our collaborators in pathology in neuropathology in cardiovascular sciences um, are in the university the medical clinic and uh, bring samples and, and come with questions and we tackle that together as a group uh, my group started with the uh, molecular biophysics uh, structural analysis of model systems small angle scattering assembly of membranes membrane fusion and over the last years we moved from diffraction more and more to imaging and um, um, uh, this is because uh, a few things happened in x-ray optics uh, you had over the years more and more um, coherent uh, sources uh, so that that phase retrieval uh, became available also computationally it became um, possible to invert coherent diffraction patterns and reconstruct an exit wave behind an object either in far field or near field and um, potentially of course that holds promise of very high resolution but it works easiest at moderate or low uh, resolution and it's still open how far we can shift this but when it comes to imaging um, we find that many of the questions we tackle it's not only the absolute resolution but the range between let's say a voxel and the field of view that you can cover and your ability to shift and zoom this this around essentially from organelle to organ or, or organism scale 
So um, that is uh, what we are doing. Okay, sorry, I'm slow here. Um, when we started to, de to develop um, this holographic inline technique that I will explain in a few slides a bit closer, we were mo motivated mainly by cellular biophysics because um, this is where, let's say, um, a lot of uh, um, biophysical questions appear, for instance, mechanics of cells, uh, cytoskeleton of cells, and um, yes, there is good reason to do uh, X-ray analysis uh, on cells. There's uh, some unique contrast uh, mechanisms that you can exploit. But we also realize that there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of optical microscopy. And so over the years, we moved away from looking at isolated cells. I begin my talk with isolated cells now to something that you can only do with X-rays, to look at hydrated or neonative or let's say um, uh, uh, unstained uh, tissues really in bulk and in three dimensions and yet preserve the ability to look into a site, into a, a single cell. This is a, an example that I don't detail here much, but where we look at the same fibroblast cell with the STET microscopy, just with the um, labeled actin filaments. We, at the same time, measure the projected electron density of all labeled and unlabeled molecules. And in different points, which are more coarsely sampled, we can, we can scan a beam and collect uh, small angle scatter scattering pattern, a diffraction pattern, to learn about, let's say, molecular structures, at least in a locally averaged sense. And we built an instrument together with my colleague Sarah Köster, uh, where we can have STET microscopy, X-ray microscopy side by side, and these two modalities inform uh, each other, and this can be exploited. Um, this is the instrument, actually, uh, the uh, Göttingen instrument for nano imaging with X-rays called uh, Genix. You can have your sample in a focused X-ray beam. You can focus uh, X-rays uh, by reflective, refractive, or diffractive optics. It's all it all lags way behind anything that you can do in the optical regime. Um, it's uh, difficult given the small wavelength to. Uh, um, uh, to uh, focus X-rays well. Here we use uh, a, a setup uh, called um, uh, Kirkpatrick bias mirrors. It's elliptical mirrors that in, in orthogonal um, mounting and um, uh, they can be polished uh, so well that right now you can get to the, let's say, um, 100 nanometer range um, uh, with this type of focusing or even below if you have uh, high enough uh, numerical aperture and uh, uh, smaller focal widths. Then you can use this focus to scan an object. At our instrument, the focus is about 300 nanometer, not quite as, as high. But then we add a, we can place an X-ray waveguide to further collimate the beam and uh, have a, or to, 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 to narrow the, the size and to increase the numerical aperture of the exit beam. The numerical aperture, as you know, directly translates into resolution. And we then move the sample in a defocused position and illuminate it with this strongly divergent and also coherence filtered X-ray beam because the waveguide supports only a few modes and can be fully um, operated in a fully coherent uh, way so that, that you lose photons, but in the end you have a very clean um, wave, uh, uh, wave front, spherical wave front, emanated basically from a point source. And then we have uh, cells, uh, um, chemically fixed or even living cells. In this case, it's cardiomyocytes from mouse. You see a few dead cells that have gone, undergone apoptosis. They are uh, roundish but others may still beat, and we can collect both diffraction patterns to see uh, molecular information on, on the thin and thick filaments, myosin and actin, but we can also go defo uh, in, a, in a defocused uh, view, and um, we can take holograms. 
I'll show you a hologram in a second. This is just to complete uh, this uh, this view. This is the beam line that we are using at the Petra re uh, storage ring. Petra 4 is a bit too early. It's, it will be upgraded in a few years. Um, this is our instrument, which is really also a bit designed for method uh, development. And um, now what, what is the method? The method basically is, uh, in optics, an old one, it's near field interference of and propagation of a beam behind an object which interferes with the reference wave. And the reference wave is the primary wave. Inline holography, um, as, as uh, essentially proposed by uh, Dennis Gabor at the time, but uh, at the time there was no good inversion. And uh, by now we have both good inversion and point quasi point focusing to get uh, a magnified view there's a simple variable transformation and you can basically on the computer you can calculate a parallel beam setup but your hologram is recorded as if in this in this coordinate system as if your detector pixel was uh, uh, 50 or 30 uh, uh, 20 nanometer size so so that uh, and 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 this can be uh, even scaled so uh, this is uh, what we do. And why is it a good idea to do this? Uh, if you look at the index of refraction for X-rays, uh, you can see that the, um, uh, the real decrement, the real part decrement uh, delta, which is related uh, microscopically to Thomson scattering and to D, which, which is proportional to the electron density. This for hard X-rays, is much larger than the imaginary part, which accounts for absorption. So um, if you can, uh, or if you are interested in uh, na the nanoscale and in, let's say, biological matter, in particular, unmineralized matter, soft, uh, medium atomic uh, and low atomic numbers, it is very beneficial to exploit the phase contrast and base your imaging contrast on delta rather than beta. This, these, this uh, as you know, the index of refraction is asymptotically, as you, if you increase photon energy, it's, it's, it's becoming one. Everything is a little bit like vacuum up to a certain point. And this, this is defined by delta and beta. What does it mean for a wave impinging through and going through a, a, a slab of uh, matter or tissue? Aside from absorption, you also have a change in wavelength, and that translates into a change of the phase. If you place your detector behind the object, you're not going to see this, but if you use free space interference over, let's say, some distance, and corresponding to some Fresnel number, you will see, you will convert that information of the object into measurable intensities. Here is again how the, the beta and delta varies with photon energy. So we can, we can now um, open the door and leave behind us 100 years of absorption contrast imaging or 120 years ever since Röntgen's uh, um, the discovery of X-rays. And we can start to see you know, this edge uh, effect here on a, on a cochlea. In, in fact, you see this little bit even at, at our lab source, a, a hallmark of this phase effect. Let's dig a little bit deeper and simulate how this image is formed and how we can invert it. Here's a 3D phantom. We take elementary shapes. Um, we have um, perfect plane wave illumination. And we take an index which we nourish with uh, simulated uh, values reflecting bio, biological matter. Take a stoichiometry representative of protein in water, something like this, at 10 kilo electron volt photon energy. So there will be a wavefront, an exit wavefront that has the projected electron density imprinted on its face, but not the, uh, the intensity. So the intensity will be flat. But now, if we uh, uh, move the detector and increase the uh, Fresnel number, uh, decrease the Fresnel number, um, we can see that uh, this self-interference uh, uh, results in an edge enhancement, enhancement and finally in a hologram. 
um, um, and uh, this hologram is very sensitive to small phase differences. At the same time, you have diffraction blurring. It's Fresnel near field diffraction. And the challenge is really, credit here to, to Dennis Gaba for, for suggesting this, but the problem, the challenge is how to go back from this measured image to a sharp exit wave. In Gabor's time, you had to use uh, back propagation of, of light. I mean, really in the lab, you took, you took a film and then show, you can shine a laser and you can sort of get this type of reconstruction with twin image problems and it's flawed. And um, for 20 years now, we, we, we have uh, a bit more rigorous numerical schemes. We can do it numerically but in linearized, in, you know, exploiting different linearizations. We can use a contrast transfer function mechanism, a formalism, and get this type of reconstruction. Now, since a few years, um, uh, there's been a lot of progress uh, in iterative reconstructions, where you take the data, maybe even in a few planes, or you take prior knowledge, positivity of your electron density, a sparsity, a, um, the fact that the sample doesn't absorb or homogeneous object, any of these, and even the three-dimensional structure of it can be a constraint, if you, if you, meaning that if, if you have uh, views from different angles, and you now get really very, very good um, reconstructions, which of course um, increases resolution and um, and image quality. Yeah, uh, we, we we often use uh, projections and reflections and alternate projections in different configurations to meet, let's say, to find the intersection between the measurement set and the and the constraint set. Uh, for instance, also finite support. In this case here, we, uh, we go to, a, let's say, a sample, a small um, uh, glass beads or no, polystyrene uh, colloids um, here, and uh, we can see that the high phase grad uh, gradients don't fulfill the uh, assumption of the linearization, whereas uh, the um, iterative techniques uh, do very well, so, so that works. Okay, so phase retrieval works. Now, let me just remind you, or let's remind ourselves of how tomography works. Yeah, I know there are also students uh, in the audience, so maybe you can enjoy a small demonstration. Here we have a small patient, which is actually a, a mouse, a small uh, uh, mouse uh, in our lab, and we rotate it and record patterns. This is absorption contrast now. And for each lines, uh, for each, uh, uh, let's say, uh, for each plane through the chest of the mouse, uh, we can take the data, write it into a sinogram. So the red line uh, has, a, it's a family of such uh, lines for each, uh, for each parallel plane. For each plane, we get this type of, of uh, uh, so-called sinogram. And then you can take this data and after a step of Fourier filtering you back uh, project this into the 3D, into the 2D plane, in the 2D space, and uh, with this, these very well established techniques, you can see the chest with the the bone, and then quite a bit of detail uh, even on on the lung of this uh, mouse. And uh, maybe at the end of the talk, I can show you that even of uh, entire small animals, we can now really get decent face contrast and see, for instance, each and every alveoli uh, in, in, in this setting. But back to more the high resolution setup of face contrast uh, at, uh, at, at GINIX, at our synchrotron instrument, uh, we have the uh, sketch, the schematic of, you know, the KB focus, the waveguide, a mode, the beam diverging again, because it diffracts and then a very smooth diffraction pattern uh, which otherwise is very hard to get for x-rays because all the optical elements of the beam line would in 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 without the waveguide be also imprinted in this empty image now we take let's say our sample and we can collect a hologram and we can divide by a very clean empty beam and then reconstruct 
this is the hologram and this is for instance the, re the restructured uh, the reconstructed phase which is proportional to the projected electron density and these are bacteria and uh, um, in fact uh, very re radiation resistant uh, bacteria and here we could show that for a relatively small um, uh, dose compared to alternative techniques where you scan the bacterium in a, in a, in a pencil beam uh, this full field holography gives us a dose efficient let's say reconstruction for this type of resolution at least and we can we can also use simulations to show that this is a good scheme and uh, stable against noise uh, we compare resolution with respect to fluence in each pixel and the typical type of work that you have to do here is a state-of-the-art uh, example this is a cardiomyocyte of a mouse it's been it's been uh, di you know, heart tissue has been uh, um, dissected by enzymes and we've collected these these cells and then you can go through this and uh, study um, the myofibrils uh, and uh, the mitochondria and you can analyze this and it may say serve a good purpose um, but uh, again do we really want to do this do we want to dissect and dissociate all these tissues where a lot of the biology now moves towards tissue scale and puts cellular knowledge into the right and proper uh, context and x-rays due to owing to their penetration power have the potential to look at something inside of something so we are interested uh, at the very smallest level in let's say the geometry of uh, the sarcomere of a myofibril yeah, that is actually performing con responsible for contractility of a cardiomyocyte but we are also interested in chains of myocytes cardiomyocytes or how the heart muscle really wraps in 3d a lot of this is 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 not well, uh, known well enough and that was uh, a good reason for us to, to see what these techniques can do. And uh, uh, this was the task of uh, Marius Reichert in his PhD, and he has just defended uh, on, on, on very nice results, collected in def different zoom magnifications, in different beam configurations, parallel beam for overview. And then at some point, we cannot take the entire heart anymore, but we have to go to, to biopsies and embedded uh, uh, tissue um, here's a here's a let's say a cube of about uh, 1.5 millimeters uh, near the apex of a small uh, animal heart of a mouse heart um, so you can see uh, quite a bit of of, of uh, detail here in the uh, left uh, ventricle and we can place that into the right context. Uh, we can zoom in further and uh, see myofibrils, uh, sarcomeric distances, and put this, this information together. If you go from small animal to human um, tissue, this is human heart tissue that we uh, obtain from uh, our pathologists. In this case, we were interested in damages of the small vasculature um, during uh, COVID-19 and this is uh, a controlled sample of unaffected uh, physiological heart muscle, uh, human heart muscle and uh, in different cuts uh, you can see quite a bit of, of, of detail in how this all comes, comes together. It's even more pronounced the structure, it's uh, more electron dense and of course a little bit larger than you have this for mouse. So that ends the example here of the of, of, of heart but speaking of COVID-19 um, while we were developing these techniques and using them for uh, neuroscience I'll show you also examples on that during the first lockdown here in Germany we talked to uh, pathologists uh, that had a, a very uh, interesting observations from standard conventional pathology uh, histopathology, histology from sections, they had um, indication that, that, that blood vessels in severe pathology of COVID-19 um, generate in not random but in very unfortunate ways they multiply and form 
um, undergo a process which is called, which they call intersusceptive angiogenesis. So a shortage of breath due to inflammation, if the virus enters deep in lung, uh, and, vir- and, and pneumonia, uh, viral pneumonia, can result in, 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 uh, in a stress and a response of, of the organ to form new blood vessels that then get clogged with, with, um, um, uh, uh, with the trombi. So we were not looking at the scales of, let's say, the uh, uh, viral host interaction of a single cell, uh, or let's say at the scale of the uh, the viral particle, but we were asking since since the fatalities most of uh, people that die uh, die from respiratory failure, uh, respiratory failure, and for that reason it was important to understand what goes wrong in lung. And uh, our collaborators uh, um, uh, studied this uh, by autopsies. As I must say, as a physicist, you're already amazed at at the lung when everything behaves as normal and physiological con- con- conditions. Yeah, you can say that everything is 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 about uh, a t- a tremendously optimized for transport, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide uh, ex- exchange into into the uh, uh, bloodstream. Um, the air that comes in, this intricate uh, system of small air sacs called the alveoli, and uh, uh, let's say a, um, a, a tissue wall between the capillaries, seven micron in cross section, and the air compartment, which is just one very thin layer of um, epithelial cells um, uh, that allow for the gas exchange. And uh, the immune system is active in this organ because a lot of pathogens come in by the uh, by the airstream, even under normal conditions. Now the clinical presentations, uh, we are now all experts and read about this uh, many times. Uh, you could uh, already diagnose in a normal clinical CT um, the strong um, pneumonia and inflammation that you can have in severe causes in lung. Uh, you see a, a, a something that that the medical doctors know as ground cla- glass opacities, and um, this is uh, this explains then this respiratory distress syndrome. A lot of vo- sub volumes of the lung are basically uh, affected, and suffer from edema, hemorrhage, and um, then also intraalveolar fibrin deposition. This this uh, syndrome of diffuse alveolar damage is known from other uh, pneumonia, severe pneumonia, and from other uh, uh, viral infections. Um, so uh, uh, my colleague, um, uh, Danny Jonik, uh, at the Hannover Medical Center and the German Lung um, uh, Center of, of, of uh, Lung Science, they wanted what is specific about uh, COVID-19. And uh, they, uh, that was in, let's say, uh, April, May uh, of uh, 2020, and they had this observation from sections that something goes wrong in uh, really the blood vessels and in the cells where, where uh, let's say, the receptors for SARS-CoV-2 enter uh, are particularly highly expressed, and then also an over-triggered and triggered overreaction of the immune system. So, uh, in their view, the disease was vasculature-driven in lung and accompanied by a very specific uh, morphogenic process, genetic process, where out of one vessel, um, by splitting over a few hours, you get uh, uh, sprouting of new vessels. And then this this gets clogged. That was uh, what they saw, but they wanted a three-dimensional uh, verification and validation of this. Uh, if you want to follow the blood vessels, you obviously need to do a three-dimensional uh, structural analysis, and that's very difficult based on, on parallel sections. Re- remember that, that histology and histopathology essentially today works with techniques when it comes to microscopy that are around for 150 years. 
um, and it's uh, pretty uh, standard. It's uh, very important, of course, the staining, the genetic expression. This is all, this is all uh, very modern. But uh, essentially, when when just looking at the images, it's optical microscopy on two-dimensional sections. So we from them we obtained. Um, tissue, post-mortem tissue of uh, patients that uh, succumbed to COVID-19. And uh, with a uh, biopsy punch in, you know, this paraffin embedded block, uh, we could mount this. And uh, uh, our question was, uh, could we confirm or falsify or refine the hypothesis of a vascularly driven disease? And more generally, can we extend classical histology uh, from 2D to uh, uh, 3D uh, and uh, really quantify things in their natural dimensionality and maybe also at higher resolution. So uh, that was uh, what we tried. And we, were, hadn't, we had worked on, on lung just a little bit, uh, but this was all mouse models. Here this was uh, a few years back, uh, long uh, before uh, SARS-CoV-2, -CoV we were interested in the migration of immune cells, uh, or our collaborators asked whether we could image for them um, uh, small animal mouse models uh, with uh, in inflammation of asthma, and they wanted to know whether immune cells migrate and how they petition and go to the site and whether they are actually in, in the, uh, the, uh, the septa and, and how that worked. For that purpose, we labeled macrophages to make them stick out by, uh, uh, by barium sulfate, actually, which they ingest. And we had some good results. We could zoom in and could even detect that, in this case, the cells were over-labeled. Yeah, there was too much uh, nanoparticles here, here in the cells, but we could see quite nicely where you had these macrophages within the lung. So um, uh, that was, was one project. In the meantime, we had more focused on, on a very different diseases and uh, the uh, human, human brain tissue, for instance, phase contrast tomography of human hippocampus, um, trying to understand the pathologies that, that arise uh, uh, during neural, in neurodegenerative diseases, like in this case here, Alzheimer's disease. And this is, is a virtual sections through, again, unstained tissue in paraffin, and in this case, recorded even in our in-house laboratory with very partial coherence, low partial coherence, but high enough to exploit phase contrast. And then after the recording and the reconstruction, you can cut the sample and stain, and you can see whether different features that come out here, let's say, as, as uh, and, and you would associate them with plugs, you can see what protein content they actually have and whether something has whether they contain iron, and uh, you can then go back into the 3D volume and really find the spatial coordinates and how they petition with respect to blood vessels and so forth. We are still working on this, but the team that was either working on cardiovascular science or uh, neuro-related uh, uh, projects now switched for a few months to, to treat this uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, problem. And uh, first thing, of course, uh, you have to see which kind of magnification and uh, data quality you get uh, at the instrument for these uh, samples, and what kind of correspondence you can make between the 2D sections, the histological finding here in different stains, and what we see in electron density contrast. Typically, we use grayscale. But um, in parallel sections, we could have one-to-one -one, um, correspondence and can see that, that for instance, thrombi and blood residue, uh, residue that, that, that fuse together um, can also be depicted in the X-ray micrograph and can re be really followed in, in, in three dimension. So uh, to give you an example on how um, Oops, uh, uh, that was too fast. Uh, let me see whether I can stop this video. Um, but it doesn't start. 
that may be a problem. Um, you can, this is a blood vessel here, a larger um, blood vessel, and you can see uh, quite uh, a number of details on the tissue uh, around the, the vessel. Um, we could uh, identify lymphocytes, cells of the immune system that come to the, this is the alveolar, an alveolar wall, and we can see fibrin uh, deposition, the so-called uh, hyaline membrane, and that also helped um, the pathologist to see, to understand the severe difficulty in breathing based on, on, on uh, a lot of debris, cellular debris that, that the gas exchange has to, has to uh, penetrate. And um, uh, when you regard, uh, uh, when you look at a certain uh, volume of tissue and want to understand the, uh, let's say, geometric um, distances between capillaries and air compartments, it's pretty clear that you need three dimensions because the closest uh, way to, let's say, um, to the gas uh, exchange or vice versa to a blood vessel may be not in the plane that you're imaging. So here we could really histogram that nicely from the data. And finally, we could trace by segmentation these splitting and the pathologies of the small vasculature that really then confirmed what uh, the pathologists were seeing in, 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 in 2D. So long story uh, short, um, uh, this data pointed at a misguided reaction to the viral attack of the entire organ. It's a systemic uh, response of the organ, and it, it is misguided also by probably an overreaction of the immune system. And the, the terabytes of data that we took were uploaded, and uh, in, in a sense, you can always only interpret the tip of the iceberg because not the collection or the reconstruction of the data is the bottleneck, but, but really the segmentation and, and the analysis uh, as we found. Here's a different example of vasculature. This is in human heart. This is a study which is, is, is uh, uh, not out yet. It's uh, in, in review. And uh, we see that uh, also in other organs, this vascular damage can, can be very clearly observed. This is uh, a control, and this is the affected vasculature of uh, uh, you know, small blood vessels in, in human heart tissue. This is, um, I don't know, a piece of about 100 uh, micrometer, 200 micrometers. And using machine learning and tracing of vessels, you can see very strong pathologies. You shouldn't, you don't want to have loops in in your blood vessels, but again, these these can form, and you can quantify this um, uh, quite quite well. So some of this um, by the um, by our co-workers, some of these insights from from two-dimensional and three-dimensional histology were fed back into the medical um, work and also uh, the, the uh, um, um, concerning the medical work of our collaborators, this has definitely helped um, uh, treatment uh, also in um, in uh, of severe uh, cases, even by simple means like um, moderating immune response um, and and so forth. I know I still have a few. Um, minutes and could finish with some work that we are normally doing um, on human brain imaging and the opportunities of face contrast tomography to zoom into a region, a target region, um, a brain region, and to map uh, as many neurons and as much of the cyto architecture as, as you can. And I'll show you uh, and the example. We have worked on human cerebellum, which is shown here, but I will only have time to show you one example. And I picked the hippocampus uh, formation, and in particular in the hippocampus, which is responsible for, for memory management and short-range memory and transition to longer-range memory and a lot of well-defined functions. Here we look at a formation knowing, known as dentus gyratus, and this is a dense 
um, area of cells. If you want to look at this in um, 3D, uh, people uh, undergo a painful procedure of parallel slices and register and putting everything together. This is uh, for mouse and even for human, this has been done a few times only because even if, if, if you relax the sections to 20 micron resolution, it is very painful to do this, uh, and, and uh, definitely you cannot do this on, on many uh, individual uh, brains or brain, t brain areas. As opposed to this, this X-ray tomography uh, view in face contrast can really target and zoom in and, and uh, really get the third dimension to something that, you, um, that will look like this in histology and very similar in uh, X-ray face contrast, but now you can you can really go in. At you can choose your resolution. Uh, you can again here uh, look for um, pathological alterations like uh, amyloid uh, um, uh, plaques uh, um, in Alzheimer's, and we were able to look uh, and, and and do a comparative comparative study for unaffected and Alzheimer staged uh, diagnosed um, um, uh, tissue from Alzheimer diagnosed uh, patients. So um, here's a movie zooming into uh, in a cartoon, but this is now real data rendered. Um, you see uh, these granule neurons um, and the vasculature, but now we move in. And even if we have a, a, a larger let's say field of view of uh, um, a millimeter uh, or larger, we can zoom in and see individual cells and uh, for instance, in particular, uh, also the nuclei of these uh, cells. Here we have plugs again, we can move into a nucleus and see a structure of heterochromatin and, and, and sub organelle scales and we can put everything together again. And then uh, this can be analyzed. It can be analyzed in terms of multidimensional distributions. Um, we segment each and every um, cell or uh, organelle, um, and then we can compare. We can compare different parameters, but it's all distributions. For each sample from each patient, uh, we have uh, a few ten thousands of uh, features. And um, of course, not all your neurons are the same in, in a certain brain region. By using mathematical techniques, constructing higher metric, higher dimensional metric spaces, and then um, linearizing them around uh, the population mean, we can then extract the dominant feature which, which uh, differ between physiological and pathological structure. And here we saw, for instance, in, in, in Alzheimer's that the uh, cell, um, uh, if these neurons undergo most likely a senescence, uh, they shut down and the, uh, uh, the uh, nuclei becomes more compact and more heterogeneous. And that, that could be uh, without even prior hy hypothesis on this point, you can read this off, uh, let's say, automized uh, analysis. Okay, we. I think uh, Valeria, if you tell me, um, uh, it's it's probably uh, uh, over time now. So I should. Yeah, be ending. I, mean, I I guess so. I mean, it's usually we stop around here. Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to close or. If you yes, yes, yes. Let me quickly uh, let me close. Of course, uh, since uh, you were inviting me, I'll close with the uh, example um, uh, on 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 cochlea and um, uh, nerve tissue, uh, and this is now almost uh, uh, a historic here. In fact, our first problem where we saw that we can get face contrast in the lab with a, let's say, compact instrument that is, it was a liquid jet uh, anode, and we could see some decent uh, uh, face contrast that was uh, a collaboration with the group of uh, Tobias Moser who work on on uh, implants, uh, implant optogenetic implants for cochlea, um, uh, and use small animal models. Collaboration with uh, Victor Hernandez and Tobias Moser, 
And um, at that point, we could see if we optimize everything, we can, let me see where that, uh, we can really get a high um, enough image uh, quality to, to see, for instance, the audio acoustic nerve and uh, to, to, to render soft tissue despite bony environments. And now uh, that was very nice, but in the meantime, we can go further and we can uh, really within the entire small animal cochlea, let's say a, a gerbil or a rat or a marmoset, we can see a lot of se uh, uh, detailed cells here, these, uh, these spiral uh, um, uh, ganglion neurons. And um, our goal uh, was, would be to see the entire nervous tissue at cellular level within uh, 3D and the entire uh, organ. And uh, maybe even over the next years, increase contrast and resolution to the point to the synaptic level. That would be um, fantastic. This here is uh, still a, a moderate resolution um, uh, view and setting at our instrument. And uh, so hopefully we can, uh, we, can, we can push this and make some progress. But uh, I will let you know. If you are interested in these techniques, uh, come and write us or come and see us. Or um, uh, the uh, synchrotron world is always uh, very open to new users. Uh, and there's also a fruitful exchange with other optical um, um, domains. Marina Eckermann in my group has uh, worked on the neuronal tissue on the hippocampus. Uh, she also highlight uh, Marius Reichert for the cardiovascular um, research uh, together with Jasper Frohn and Marina. The three PhD students worked on, on lung in COVID-19 and Mareike and Annalena uh, worked on face tomography uh, before. And I also acknowledge our collaborators, of course, in the medical clinic and the mathematical department when we work on inverse problems and reconstruction and optimal transport. Markus Osterhoff in the group, who is uh, really the main uh, responsible for the uh, for our end station. And I thank you for your uh, attention and I'm uh, happy to, to answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, so there are already some questions for you. The first one uh, is through the microphone. Professor Mendoza, please. Um, uh, hi, uh, do you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Well, first of all, just just wonderful uh, what you're doing. This technique is just really mind blowing. So fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Of course, congratulations for all the work that you have done in 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 the in vivo or or in uh, let's say human things. You know that uh, will certainly help uh, to to have a much better life. Um, however, you know, I have, I don't know if it's a suggestion or you might know about it already. Uh, the biologists, and especially uh, evolutionary biologists, uh, they are very keen to know uh, what, what's going on in mitochondria, uh, but not in vivo, but I mean, these uh, mitochondria that they find in, in fossils of, you know, maybe uh, billions of years old. I don't know if you have, if you have have contact with, you know, a group of biologists that they might be interested in using your uh, wonderful technique just to, uh, to I, follow the traces of the beginning of life. I, I, I uh, this, um, uh, no, I've, I've uh, not worked on this and I'm not too familiar, but I, I, I can see sometimes at the synchrotron that these samples, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, typically, you know, if it is small uh, early organisms in, in amber or a few hundred million years back, there's a unique opportunity to do it with non-destructive methods because they're extremely uh, precious and then to zoom in. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I mean, these samples are very uh, precious. I, th I think with these communities, you have to work very closely and uh, gain enough uh, conf confidence and, and really show what these techniques can do. Uh, but uh, uh, as soon as you cannot uh, dissect and have no uh, alternatives, I think this is, uh, this is uh, very true, very true. No, I have, we, we haven't worked on this uh, yet. Okay, well, just as a, you know, mm -hmm. a humble mm -hmm. suggestion from my mm -hmm. part, I mean, it will be great mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. 
we are yeah. uh, getting contact with you know this yes uh, yes, yes 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 just, yes just wonderful yes. Mm -hmm. and thanks thank a you. lot thank you uh i have another question here a written one uh so they say in some of your experiments have you had a problem with the ghost holographic image this is professor alcala Ochoa. um uh, yes uh, absolutely uh, the reconstruction is uh, uh, tricky. Uh, let me see whether I can end the uh, and uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on this. If your iterative algorithm doesn't uh, work uh, very well, uh, if you don't know how to do it and you use, let's say, a single step propagation, you will always have these uh, artifacts. Uh, if you want a fast uh, single step phase retrieval, you will still, for instance, in this CTF uh, phase retrieval, uh, you won't get rid of some edge enhancement and some things that, that, that are also related to the twin image problem. In the end, only these iterative uh, controls uh, really help to get rid of this, uh, to have enough data and to formulate something which is consistent. Here, for instance, in this example, um, the image quality is due to the fact that we outline the border of the cell from, let's say, a holographic reconstruction we get with some, um, uh, some twin image, we, we get a fairly good um, reconstruction that allows us to say let's draw a support and then the, for the remainder of the reconstruction with iterative techniques we use this support uh, constraint and then this gives the uh, a better quality yeah but but it's 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 uh, much of what keeps us busy and the fact uh, that if we have more than one recording a few uh, Fresnel numbers some diversity in the data, or if we move laterally, we can also completely um, kill these artifacts, even um, even if we don't have a support constraint. Yeah, for um, yeah, but uh, a very good point. Uh, I don't know. Is is there any more questions? I have a few here, but I, I wait for other people to ask. If <laughs> oh yes, and other ones. Uh, is it possible to obtain information about myelin? Yes, in, we, were, we had an interest in myelin as well, since my background is in membrane biophysics, and we worked also on uh, a peripheral nerve uh, system, on uh, um, fine structure of uh, optical, uh, of, of different nerve for mouse and, and uh, and men, and um, I don't have data now in, in this presentation on this, but um, in that case, we stained myelin by uh, osmium tetroxide, and um, we could see very well the myelin sheath of different axons and uh, Schmidt Landemann incisures and uh, Ranbier nodes. But to see, let's say, the spacing between myelin membranes. Um, this we can also do, we also studied this, but by focused beams and diffraction. So ideally you would, you would reconstruct, uh, for instance, uh, myelinated nerve tissue, maybe with some contrast agents, maybe not to some extent, but this would allow you to, to trace axons, which is highly interesting, for instance, retina to optical nerve to really do this uh, uh, connectivity uh, or let's say uh, tracing uh, different uh, axons uh, in, a, in, in a big nerve and uh, correlating this. If we want to understand the myelin sheath distance, the periodicity, then we have to go to the focus position and use diffraction. Yeah. Uh, some more questions here. Uh, one more. Uh, is it possible to include a modulation signal to split the spectral components uh, of the hologram or try with an OC axis configuration? Um, I'm not sure whether I uh, understand uh, com correctly. Uh, 
is, is are you referring to to off-axis holography and having a, a a reference wave which is not the primary wave the spectral components um let's see um uh, the it, it what i showed you here is is pure is is all monochromatic it's all single wavelength uh, hologram um you can record holograms in white light uh, there may be advantages uh, to do face retrieval even in the laboratory it's broadband pass um uh, in in the end situation um um uh, is quite different than than optical coherence uh, tomography i think but i'm also not sure whether i understand the the answer correctly what we did try is off-axis holography when we take a waveguide channel and we split we can have one sample uh, one beam on the sample and a second one hitting the detector and this can be beneficial this can be clearly beneficial for reconstruction and for let's say phasing uh, the low frequent the low spatial frequencies well, let's see if the dr flores is is gonna um confirm or want to ask some more questions there is another one here uh, i'm impressed thanks for such an interesting talk in order to go further in nanoscale imaging what should be the features of illumination source yeah that's 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 a, a very good uh, question that's a very good question because we have some flexibility in designing uh, this uh, we would love to have even higher numerical aperture and that means that we have to uh, improve focusing or let's say uh, uh, we have waveguides with nine nanometer uh, guiding layer and this would be fantastic but uh, we haven't been able to get enough light through to uh, it's we're working on tapered waveguides um, it's also sometimes it works in planar waveguides but not in channels uh, fabrication is, is a problem but with the uh, latest generation synchrotrons and uh, the upgrades in Grenoble and hopefully also in DAISY, uh, the the photon um, density is there so we could be we could we could be asking for more we also worked with with the um, uh, high resolution zone plates uh, for holography so basically what we want is um in in uh, in, in focusing sometimes people um claim a very good spot size and they do have a very small spot size but then there, there are a lot of tails and that means in, um, in in the hologram, you even in the empty hologram, you will see a lot of features. It won't look as clean as as, as this. And these features don't divide out by taking the empty beam because um, you shouldn't divide intensities. You should divide um, a fully phased uh, amplitude images, and that's not always uh, important. So an ideal probe would be really. Um, uh, highly compact, zero intensity in the tails, and uh, then uh, I would say um, uh, up to very recently, we, we said, yeah, let's go for sub 10 nanometer focal widths. Right now, we have changed this a little bit because we saw that we can reconstruct to below the um, uh, point, uh, the spot size, if we use uh, for holographic reconstruction also the tails and the uh, a little bit of diffraction data in the tails of the hologram this is something that we call uh, maybe not very modestly we call this uh, super resolution holography it's been published in um, optica uh, this year and we could sh we could go down to 11 nanometer resolution with a focus uh, spot size which was larger but again compactness was was very important yeah thank you for the question uh another one uh i i guess it's uh, tr uh trying to clarify the, the previous question mm -hmm. with modulate mm -hmm. i mean to use some techniques used in visible holography as the use of modulators or angle variations uh, or phase shifting techniques yeah 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 um we haven't we have don't have uh, th that's also an excellent uh, question how could we get more diversity in the holograms and i think there's a lot to explore so far we had this idea of having 
the cleanest quasi spherical wavefront and take this holographic illumination out but to add a control variable and 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 record holograms with with the uh, 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 additional wavefront modulators and known structures also works we had one topographic um, near field topographic uh, uh, um, work where we explored this and uh, it definitely also uh, can be can be exploited uh, to stabilize uh, phase retrieval we are now thinking a little bit of x-ray optics on a chip of having several channels with different functionalities and uh, oblique incidences and, and more designed light fields but we would like to understand more clearly by simulation what is really the benefit and uh, uh, when this is needed. Mm -hmm. Sure, so if, if there's no more questions, perhaps I add a quick one. Yeah. Uh, um, what about, have you made any progress in trying to uh, use at least some of these uh, techniques that you showed us uh, for the analysis of tissue, which is either in a live condition or closer to living conditions for example hydrated yeah 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 excellent question as well hydrated tissue is a little bit more demanding because the internal contrast is is lower but it works if you go to the synchrotron and you go to the deep holographic regime um, we did uh, uh, image uh, human tissue in PBS um, and uh, you could do it also on let's say fresh tissue we definitely are not um, uh, the dose we we, we invest uh, would uh, not allow uh, in vivo uh, analysis uh, on, on on humans, a small animal, yes, but then not at the highest resolution. Um, but uh, let's say if you want to avoid uh, artifacts from dehydration or uh, chemical fixation, I think there's a lot to do, and uh, um, unstained. Uh, uh, hydrated tissue we, we saw for, for, for brain tissue that, that, that this works. Um, we are also now thinking about translation to let's say closer to the clinic and this would work on laboratory instrumentation and there uh, I have doubts then you need a, a very strong stain. Also uh, you have to be uh, uh, you know it's it, it, a tomographic rec uh, rec uh, scan can undergo motion if things are not well mounted. So the uh, the embedded tissue is always much easier, of course. More, higher signal, much easier, but that shouldn't keep keep us, of course, from from going down that route and and go to more um, and, and 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 maybe arti artifact free uh, preparation. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. I don't. I, I see there are no other questions popping up. So let me thank you once more. Thank you a lot for this very interesting presentation and uh, uh, have a good weekend. <laughs> very nice. Uh, Valeria, thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I uh, wish you and uh, all your colleagues at uh, CIO a, a, a nice uh, Friday uh, noon and lunchtime and uh, um, a good afternoon and uh, equally a nice uh, autumn weekend. It was uh, great uh, to be here. I, I wish it, it would be in presence. It would be more <laughs> exciting. Soon you know. I would we'll join be able a lunch. to invite you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Goes another back time. To normal. <laughs> yes. Great. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.